All right, the recording starts. Okay, so um, we're going to have um, an Amazon Web Services overview. Um, so Amazon, um, you know, one of the cloud providers, they have uh, a collection of web services that comprise the cloud computing platform. Um, today I'm going to talk about a few of these services, a few of the popular ones. Um, the EC2, which is their compute, a database service. Um, S3 is their file-based storage service, one of the document-based storage services. Uh, Life of load balancing, or load balancing, as opposed to email, um, any kind of caching framework. Uh, identity management is mostly used for controlling access inside your new cloud environment. And uh, your virtual private cloud is networking. So they got a lot of stuff. Um, really, it's a big alphabet soup. Uh, people have been posted um, the alphabet supersizing the, all of the acronyms they use in here. And after a while, you can see the FCC or even know what the acronyms are when you long now. So, a couple of pieces in here I'm not going to cover um, that are um, kind of interesting is um, there's SQS, so the queuing service. You kind of get everything that's in like an enterprise architecture, and they've got a service for um, SMS, which is notification service. Um, they've got some things around uh, screen processing, which is last they get several different options for data storage. So that's your kind of document oriented. So make sure it's like long term archival storage, backup is long time. Probably an EDS is more of a more of a remote file system, like an actable file system. You can allocate some storage and move around between them. Product, most of which are in RDS. They've got some other stuff. So, um, how do you use these cloud services, right? Most of, in most of these environments, um, you've got a bunch of hosts. And traditionally, people kept all those hosts internally and they ended up in their own data centers where they had admin that had control. Upgrade, OS upgrade, as opposed to this application version of how you use how you use the server. So this is a, an example of a shared uh, continuous integration environment, um, which I'll also drop a link in there. You know, one of the example references. So is anybody using continuous integration in browser? Show of hands. Um, do you know if those are on cloud services or locally hosted? They just have data centers. So that, I know the project that I'm on. That's just locally. Yeah, we. Well, I mean, the project that I'm, that I'm on, they they had a local a local server, and now in the last like two months, they've moved them into the cloud. So yeah, you know, the advantages of, of you know using a continuous integration environment is you're gonna you know, pull pull the code. Build it somewhere on a build server, and then the build server will actually go about orchestrating your cloud environment, or if you post locally your, your local environment, it'll, it'll build out and populate all the servers uh, you know, from the artifact. That so way, you just check your code and build environments that you created. So, who they can be with, right? It's, um, as of fourth quarter last year, they were kind of dominating the market. Um, but you can see from the year-over-year the -year growth that this environment is changing very dynamically and also you can see some of the things you don't know. It's a very uh, cost-conscious environment. It's what their back-end costs are. That's what they could provide their services for. And as you'll see in the in the EPC stuff, um, you know, costs are kind of intricate. Uh, the people who are also, very cost sensitive, we're going to be able to move their cloud services around. 
So, so some of these, like Google and Netflix, they've got their own internal clouds that are much bigger than what they provide to others because they've got such compensation on their So when you, um, of course, they're administrating your cloud to the web, and this is what the EC2 console looks like. Um, when you hit the services tab, you get all the 44 services in the cloud right now. So you have to go into the alphabet to find out what you're looking for. But here you can you can filter your host. You're a filter for one host. Uh, otherwise, you can just get everyone with all the hosts that you've got. Um, and then uh, and here you can click on uh, monitoring. So you can start monitoring the host. But because it's an EC2 host, you can log into the host directly to get all that you can find out about. 
network performance and using memory allocation and process. That kind of stuff. Um, and efficient username. This is where you can manage the host of things you need to type. Or, uh, the data which is the um, you know, They offer a number of different database uh, database engines. Um, MySQL and Aurora, which is an ethics based um, wireline compatible MySQL that is on their their own. The advantage, uh, the real advantage of the database services is that um, they they provide patching services and are intimately direct to patching. So for engine updates, much like the OS update, um, they can be able to stack your host up, you bounce it, and you have the new you have the new version of your engine to run your updates. You don't have to that in the session you're having to keep time on that. Well, um, they also provide for um, hooks into the engine for any of the clustering and failover. So if you want to allocate, um, and you can do the same thing for Unix. So if you want to allocate hosts in different regions, you can you can host them in on East Coast, West Coast, and the US, and then globally they stack kind of off your buddies. But you can put them into which are much trickier if you're managing your own resources set up solo and data center. So one of the projects that I worked on, we were doing applications on solo, set up clinical servers, and ran that project. Um, it takes a while to do that kind of stuff. All the failover and you know, get all those hooks set up and work with the resources. Yes, OS people need to allocate some other things. What do you think about the failover clustering for all database and any? This, this specific piece here is for databases, but if you're, if you're going to do co location for your ECP host, you'd have to manage that failover the application of the So I think it's one of the you want your database to have failover, right? So that's where how we can take it. You have another instance, Amazon can share it to the rest of the uh, uh -huh. Yeah. So you basically just say, I want to, I want to, I want to allocate another host and put them in the cluster, and it'll it will replicate your data via. I mean, that's that's the advantage of this as a service. Not like there's specific options and we've done a little bit of application tuning with the MySQL engine. Um you know, with like IO threads and some other things. Then you can get into the nitty-gritty and you're getting away from um tension stuff and other kind of stuff. So we only we only teach a couple of settings. Um, but yeah the, that that's the nice thing about this. We're not we're not using the um the customer And then, of course, by building, it's got a complicated, but it's difficult to tell exactly how much you're going to need to build for when you need to build this service because it's by instance class, which is the size of the database host, and what that's multiplied by the number of hosts. Um, how much now you're actively using that um, baseline, how much CPU you need or CPU? Because they don't expect a database host to be maxed out for CPU all the time, and that's what's in the value here. Um, storage in terms of just raw table space, space per month. I.O. requests per month, uh, backup storage per month, network data transfer. And that's really where the instance size matters is how much you can get in and out of the box. So they're going to get every, there's not like a cheap place to get. If your app uses a lot of data, you can get And of course, tuning that. Um, disadvantages is you don't get any post access. So you can't log in to the database. So you get um, client level access. So, like a standalone client for uh, MySQL server plus, and you can attack the SQL plus if you dump at that level, but you can't get onto that host or run proxies on that host uh, because it's a database service. It's, it's not a host. Yeah, it's got it's got advantages and disadvantages. I mean, that's that's the thing is it's nice because you got the clustering failover that you normally need to configure. Um, if you didn't want to run um, a database intensive job and you wanted to skip the network cost. Then it's good. So I know in SQL Server, one thing that I'm uh, profiler is actually kind of uh, all the problems that I do in the past. You know, the thing that through um, that, like, you don't have access to the code, 
I don't I don't know how SQL Server what the best feature is. Um, you know, probably explain plan, you know, in terms of my SQL and Oracle is what, what level of access is. Um, you can get in on the next slide, you can get some performance information, um, which I'll this is after this. But this is what this is what those hosts look like in the console. Um, so you can get your host it gives you some information about how what the activity looks like in terms of number of connections. Um, and then you get an output of all of the recent events and alarms that happened in the database. Here it's showing that it was restarted and that um, you know, it was applying You can see where you are in terms of usage or storage and that kind of stuff. So it does give you does give you storage. Are you fully operating in the Oh, you need a lot of You can get it through to the database host. Yeah. And, you know, we have the same thing that you have for us. So we can have a database and go in that. You can use it on that. You can use it on the other So additionally, um, the button at the top, you can show your monitoring. And then you can get much more detailed information. So um, we still use this when we're doing lots of data crunches to see what the host is doing. Um, but CPU usage and, and your connections. Um, are you running out of space? Are you, you know, you got all the mem RAM memory? And then you can get the screen right and what the network traffic looks like and then six other things as well. You get a lot of stuff. You get a lot of information. I mean, at first I was very concerned about not being able to get onto the host. I think there's some advantages of having a mix of hosts that both use the database service and having your own database service. So um, S3. So S3 typically is used for uh, document uh, as opposed to block level file file name. So here you would want to store you know, PDF um, or other or other images or things, um, and they have classes of storage that you provide, but S3 is actually a file storage service, so you can pass resources, um, URLs into the S3 server, so if you want your documents not going through your application, like you serve them in like a PDF, you don't have to push that through your application server, you can um, pass to their API, make a document available to a certain key for a certain period of time and then pass up to somewhere else. So they can have like 15 minutes or three minutes to download their PDF or begin downloading their PDF. And then that way you can host you don't have to host these necessarily where your um, you know, where your application server is used as well as you can use it. And it doesn't use up your application server resources. Um, it also supports um, you know, different storage classes depending on how frequently you access it. Again, there's not really a place where you can get you know, three or two fast sets. If you're going to use it more, you're going to pay a little more because I'll, I'll bump you up uh, depending on your access to the charge. Uh, it does have some nice encryption options. Um, you can encrypt, you can either manage your own encryption and provide um, provide just the encrypted files. If you do need to manage your own key and everything is fast encrypted, um, or you can set up keys that once they hit the S3 service, they'll be encrypted um, there. So you want to manage that. Of course, to and from the service, you get HTTPS. Uh, but it's, um, and then you know, get that time access to the object available. Um, again, you can push this out to different regions, um, and it supports document versioning. You know, when you have a version of the PDF, you can it. Their, their tiers are, are uh, you can get above 5,000 terabytes, so you can set a byte range. But, um, above that, they have, you know, good storage, because it's just not that much terabytes. Uh, but yeah, they're being the cheapest, that's the cheapest one. It's 2.7 cents.
will of course you build a request by storage and by transfer. Every piece of the infrastructure that you hit you're moving in your So what does it what does it look like? So I'm just gonna put I'm gonna drop an example and I'll just I'll drop an example of you know where you're gonna put um, how the AWS cloud will interact with your enterprise environment. Um, kind of a price. So um, you know, part of this is based on stuff we've actually created and are using. Um, so if you've got Clients that are using you know, phones or tablets, and you've got other clients who are using laptops. Um, and in this example, we'll have like a session. So you'll have some internet facing um, uh, service um, that's a word now. So we do have a class and the request will come in. And they'll be interacting in this like, um, you know, HTTP, HTTP. And then you'll have your application for request. So this is going to represent the HTTP environment. So you run things on here like Apache, um, you know, Python, uh, Java. Um, and you can, you know, in the cloud environment, you can cluster these. Um, so they've got some automatic load balancing. That's available in AWS where you can configure um, you configure your load balancers so that it will check the health of these hosts and you can set up rules for checking those hosts. And it can kill hosts and it can fire up new hosts depending on um, depending on those rules. So if one host is being overloaded, still out of spread, so you can check out. Um, so from here there'll be um, a database layer. And you've got the same options here, right? You can, you can have things be available regionally, you can have clusters, uh, that itself. Um, so these guys talk about these guys. And let's say you wanted to provide a data file back from your application server cluster to your clients that you didn't necessarily need those other services, right? You can convert these exchange documents. Um, um, also, if you do that, you're not you're not loading up your database with blobs like that, and then you also manage the file system. So the application server would communicate with S3 uh, via the API, and then you could provide a, a URL and then the client to request that. So get the document and you can say, this is open for five minutes. You're like, hey, I want to download my statement. They, they can't really tell you this. They just click on a link. And this thing will say, make this a link available before it shows the page. It's okay, it has to provide a piece of that. And go up there. If they get it and they say it's denied, if they go back to the page and look at that, crazy. Um, so, and that's why that's why I put a bunch of notes up there. It was so much easier to draw when I was a student. Um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, let's do let's do the here and then this. So if you've got other other resources, um, you know, it's like a customer relationship management system. Again, it's going to talk to your your application server through an API, a set of API calls, and these will be shuttled back and forth. But then you get other users that are consuming things off the current system, like um, account representatives. Um, Uh, no, this would be like an internal CRM, you know, or you can, it could be hosted externally. So I think uh, in Salesforce hosts their stuff externally. So you might have options that you need to go logic to be able to host that. Um, so the team's got to be interacting with the CRM system. 
In this, in this case, there's some artifacts where um, the CRM system doesn't support, um, or this part isn't configured to support an S3 service, and these guys need to be able to get a hold of documents that, that they're submitting that won't necessarily get a bin. In that case, um, this has external service, um, SCP service, taking up load, that goes to um, a file share box. And um, those files come in and those files can be available. Well, I mean, a lot of these highly integrated environments, and then you can choose, you know, do you want to host these locally, do you want to put those in the cloud? <coughs> what makes sense? Do you want to really be in the business of, of managing um, file services and that kind of thing? Is that a potential government option? So, um, so here there's also e an email service, so SES is, uh, is an email service. And in this case, um, you go back and forth with account CV. Um, address change and password. So that's the password. So that would go to the email service and the email service um, Um, we've got data warehouse features that um, populate that populate this guy. And that's an external system, or that's an internal an internally hosted system um, that creates um, some jobs that folks go around and through an ETL service. Um, this is a local host, uh, an internal an internal host. Um, these are actually processed by the application. So that's it. That leads. Um, um, This is cloud, this is the provider. Here we go. Um, this also happens to have, this is a message, it has an index search service. <laughs> so, um, if you've got, I mean, this example would make sense with something like if they had um, stocks, um, mutual funds, or something as large numbers of things that a search team can do search team as well, and that's coming from a third party service like a stock exchange, you want to bring it in and index that, or maybe multiple stock exchanges, and provide one resource to the guy that will support everything. Um, then that would be a good option for an index to go and generate that. And that's the thing to provide the service to the application. Yeah, it's the same as what you said. Is that the cloud? No, this is not a cloud. This is the thing that's not a cloud. But I don't have it. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they're right. I, I know they do. I know they do some other services. They probably do. Probably. They, I know they do some other services around um, um, some of the uh, big data. Big uh, data pieces. I know Redshift might be in that. But, um, and then where, where the cloud really shines is. Um, Um, is if you, you know, this would be in your production environment, what you're using, you're using, but of course you got to write the software, you've got to test the software, and all those resources have to go somewhere. So in this case, you've got another stack that has your application services, you have your DLD in different domains, um, 
your RDS here. Um, and then it should be, you know, these non cloud services would have to have to be available to the environment. Um, so with this, this could be like a user assessment test environment, and then you can have an integration environment. Change it more quickly than that. It has the same resources. Gives you the advantage of if you need multiple of these, you can either have you know, tests like your um, clustering features here, um, but you can also have it completely stand up another environment. And so, and then on the back end, you've got your the build server that is communicating with your illustrated party. I get up and get the developers and then they see it. There. With these codes. Uh, and then this thing's firing and orchestrating two tracks of this. This orchestrates two tracks of this. And in this case, this one this is also cloud. And these are all cloud. Which lets three different varied environments. You need to fire up, you know, more integration environments as they have any changes that are coming through that might take multiple months to implement. Um, you could fire up, you know, one of those pieces back up. I thought it could have been used with it, but that was the everything in the Certain ones. Certain ones. I think it's kind of figured about this, right? Yeah. So you don't need four nights. So the monthly the monthly loads go from the from the data warehouse so they're the same. Any questions about this or any other architecture questions in general? Do they allow you to pick a data type? You pick region. Um, I I don't know. I mean, um, probably could, probably could, but you certainly pick region. You say, hey, I want the East Coast. And then there's like, um, you know, different, different types um, within that. Okay, so you can guarantee that you have some set of hardware. Right, geographically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. right. You can't pick like, you Right. Right, you can't say it's like four, you know. Yeah. Um, so typically, when you have an architecture like this for redundancy, if you want to have uh, something in different geographic locations, um, and in this case, if it's scripted, then you wouldn't necessarily have to have set up there, but you'd have to have the system there. So, database, so let's just say this is all in our Excel plain down. Boom. Data center is gone, along with all your data. So it's toast. But if you have real time replication to this other database, which is less toast, then both. It creates these kind of issues, right? Because, I mean, for example, the build server seems to be one of the most fun that you can use. But in other words, in the East Coast, that issue, so you have an email set up to have the West Coast. And there's some batches there that you wouldn't expect to be running your own. Email host. Um, you know, the email service is pretty good. I mean, it's it's, it's uptime. It's uptime is pretty good. We've actually seen issues with it. Um, however, the issues you really had is doing the email authentication, not with the email service itself. So the email service um, may be fine, but when the authentication service is down, you can't get to any of them because it's trying to authenticate your account. And we found that when we tried one, we failed over, and it, that also wouldn't let us authorize. There's also a couple of features when I was testing that feature and writing the email server for managing the application. Um, it, uh, uh, it locks out your account when you fail the email uh, a couple of times. And even if you buy ballot credentials in the problem at all, won't let you log in. So it was hard to do. But then, like, a little, little things like that that complicate the. And then, um, you know, the resources. Um, so I, I don't know, I missed the whole bit, so sorry to put it on the 
found that I'm using Amazon um, traditional VM based stuff. Give you a VM of whatever size, you send it to a VM. Uh, the nice thing about those is you get a VM with the OS on it, the capital or whatever database, and you have control over it. Um, and you get an IP address, NAS, you get control, um, and it all comes with it. And my experience over the years using Amazon was there was always unexpected things that were. I think it's because of the a la carte nature of Amazon. You can buy anything, and they want to give you the ability to not buy what you don't need. But I also felt like it added a, a large level of extra complexity uh, for people that weren't familiar with it. Once you're up to learning the program, it's probably obvious to go buy IP address. Whereas if you get a VM from Access, you get an IP address with it, right? Like it's not intuitive for a person that. Is not used to this sort of this this using these um, for the developer installation is good. Um, however, it does require its own skill set. So I mean, there are clearly um, you know, cloud engineers that know how to use these tools remotely. So Amazon has an API that allows you to manipulate code and code configuration, so you can fire this stuff off. Um, but it's non-trivial to get all that stuff working right. Um, just like you were talking about, it's mostly you know, it's working inside the cloud, but it's like, where's my DMV? Um, how do I confirm that this traffic is secret to How do I confirm the traffic going between various codes is the right port? You don't want everything open. You don't want certain ports open. You need to be able to get access. Integrating your data center, your own data center, to the virtual private cloud through something that's not um, publicly available. Yeah, so I guess the question is when, and, and this clearly shines when you have volume or uh, intermittent scaling, whereas traditional VM can shine when you have web app setup, right, that is very vanilla, which we have a lot of, we have a lot of both, right, but um, so what, in your opinion, when, at what point does extra I, th I think when you want to do experiments, when you don't know exactly what you need, um, when, you, when you're going to be creating something that will have variable um, and, you know, I think that's when you want to go with this. You're like, you know, should I have a bigger host? Um, if, you, if you're managing your own host or even with VM, um, here you can, you can basically change the config and say, I want this to be a larger host. Um, I don't care. Um, there's a couple things you can have to play around with in terms of complexity, and that's like having a clustered uh, or load balanced host is dynamic, and you add different size hosts into that. Um, but you can clearly get into something when you're rotating through this. Not sure that it'll be simple to set up, but it's available. Right, but and usually the operational complexity of it that makes it not worth it. Um, people that are running these kind of servers, stability, simplicity, no, no changes. Yeah, I think in this in this environment, um, there's probably 200 hosts, and I think there's three people that are primarily you know, that primarily you know, with the people. When you say VMs, are you are you are you talking about like virtual private cloud? So every provider, um, so I mean, do this company cloud. Cloud VM, okay, right? So, I, and that's what you get in the terminology here in cloud, right? Okay. So, the, the, if I go to Rackspace and they call it their virtual cloud server, because you're paying by the hour, you're paying for it, okay? So, the VM gives you the address, an OS, choice. Um, so, it's not like a service. I mean, real disk, the hot cake disk. Um, real persistence disk that doesn't disappear. But it gives you no surprises, right? It literally gives you, yeah, it gives you a server that's not, you don't have to physically deal with. Um, so, and you can ramp the size up and down of it by clicking. Um, so, it, but it's. So, you're using, like, you're using the same disk. 
Maybe now, yeah, I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Years past, I've tried it, and there's always been a gap. It's always like, oops, your disk doesn't persist, or oops, you don't have an IP address, or oops, right, you, know, you, you got to use Bill this month because you somebody you know did something weird or something. Like that. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the issues we have seen um, in the environment is because at 8 a.m. have a have a hard time coming up because everybody's waking up, everybody's getting their first bill, and the network traffic goes down. There's the response time. I guess another question is, um, do they do Docker yet? Um, all your other environments are Docker. Yeah, I, I, uh, I play around Docker a little bit locally, but not as it relates to Amazon. Yeah, and then there's a few different things, like security stuff, where you can um, you know, jump between machines and things like that. Um, I like the fact that you're basically checking the configuration as part of the tip off Docker. Um, I wanted to set up the database service and host. One is so that everybody on the team cared about Docker and didn't have to build it itself. But um, the complexity is a little bit, specifically with the data, local database setup, you've got to um, set up your host in your own Docker image. But if you want to, you don't want to enable in that Docker image to set up protecting it, and you have to let the team in the it. It's just that little bit of config makes it harder to set up. That's a double issue. How do I create one, get it to stay, so that way I can swap out my data independently of my engine when we did updates and didn't have to go away that way. I'm going to